again we meet you to present this series of interviews with the poets who came from different European countries in order of attending the Poetry Week, which has held by the Renovico and the Kiriantalo in Turku. Klaus Andersen is our guest this time, who came from the Danish capital Copenhagen to the first capital in Finland and the capital of European culture, Turku. In bed, the travel through his poems, Heart of Audience. Let's come to together. Welcome to Turku. Thank you. Okay. Is this your first time you have visited the city? Uh, no, I have actually been here. I, I think this this must be my third time, mm -hmm. I think, in, in Runovico. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and so, um, yeah, it's with great pleasure that I that I come back to the city, I really love it here. Mm -hmm. What's the, the first impression you have taken about Finland? Um, when I when I arrived in Helsinki for the first time, this was before the Runuviku, I was invited to another festival in Pispala. Mm -hmm. And at that time when I landed in Helsinki, I was struck by the fact that there were no graffiti at all on the walls. That struck me as very weird. But yeah, <clears throat> it was kind of strange that mm -hmm. that the city was kind of completely clean of graffiti. That was my first. That it was very orderly and very organized and very civilized. And mm -hmm. and then another thing I, I discovered was that there is room for quirkiness here. You can be you can wear a pot on your head as a hat and nobody will look at you strangely. This is a very nice thing in Finland then, mm -hmm. that I don't find in so many other countries, especially not the Nordic countries, that are very dominated by a, the same Protestant ethics, but sort of a different version of it. Would you tell us about your beginnings in poetry? My, I started writing poetry when I was a teenager. I wrote my first poems when I was basically 15, just starting in high school, 15, 16. Uh, that collection was never published, but I still, it's in my dad's house and I still, yeah, I still have that collection. It's very, um, it's very depressed poetry, typical teenage poetry. But also back then I did political stuff uh, like I, I do today and mm -hmm. that was the beginning. Then when I was 23, I, I, I started in my early 20s, I started writing short stories and I had this collection accepted from a Danish publisher. And basically, I I went to the Middle East to write for a year or two mm -hmm. until the publisher decided not to publish that collection out of the mm -hmm. blue. And that led me to, I was very disappointed about that, of course, so that led me to forget all about my writing, put it in the dresser, and just think, fuck it, I'm gonna be an academic anyway. So I enrolled in university and mm -hmm. started that path. And only after that, I took uh, fiction writing and poetry writing up again and started writing. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing it for the past 15 years as a full-time writer. Uh, yeah, and that's where we are today. What about your projects of poetry? I think it, 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 it mainly centers around... Well, there are certain red threads in, 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 in the poetry that I do. With, there is a political dimension, a mm -hmm. political systems critic uh, dimension of it. There is of course the whole emotive dimension like the love poetry uh, and there and there is um, an esoteric uh, or occult kind of side to it so i do also these poems um, mm -hmm. partially political partially about love love revolution and transcendence basically yeah that's that's three topics that you will see Mm -hmm. basically uh, running through my work, I guess, pretty much as a red thread. Also, I do a lot of travelogue poetry, like I, lo I do a lot of writing in different places. Mm -hmm. I like to write when I'm on the go, like here in Turku or in, in Tallinn, or it could be in New Delhi or in on Manhattan, wherever I am, I like to write there mm -hmm. uh, about the places also and about what they, what they kind of tell me. So I have that also, uh, a lot of poetry about that. Mm -hmm. From different places. Ram poetry, list poetry, not unlike this poetry. Auto fictional, 
tribute and stigmatic poetry, esoteric, esoteric, political poetry, revenge poetry, revolutionary, rebellious and cooking poetry, yoga poetry, vocal poetry, milf, emergency hilf and thrill poetry, found poetry, cut up poetry, stolen, inspired and defeat poetry, stand up for humanity and fight, clock poetry. Flower poetry, power poetry, it's all up to you, poetry. Being you, poetry. Being poetry, my poetry, your poetry, just poetry. My pores as first light, rushing to be caught from the flow, transfixed and transformed, kept and cultured, masked to belong, named to resonate better, echoing back towards the great unknown of a reader's heart. Out there, somewhere, somehow, suddenly, my poetry is the dream I dream every night only to awaken to a long poem of daylight, human misery carved in flesh and bouncing off black solution. Of course, you're all going to come and party with us and have a lot more poetry, right? Yeah, Tilla Futi! Come on, right. Um, this one is kind of like down the same aisle, basically. It's from this beautiful anthology that, uh, that was just published in England. Uh, hold it, hold it. <laughs> during the London Literature Festival, we were a bunch of wackos and, and crazy people and, and waiting screens, chasing forever the now we can almost remember. The now we can almost remember, friends, but never grasp that the set transition came. Redemption was here, an absolute now, while we were all busy looking the other way. <laughs> Waiting screens, chasing forever, the now we can almost remember. The now we can almost remember, friends, but never grasp that the set transition came. Redemption was here, an absolute now, while we were all busy looking the other way. To what extent the experiment of traveling can help poets to discover new worlds or new horizons? I think, well, well I like it so much, so of course I have to recommend it to everybody, especially fellow poets. That you know, if 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 you're not traveling yet as a poet, I think you should, because even though I mean there are different ways. You can travel the world while sitting in this chair, not moving at all. You can do this, but you can also actually leave the chair and travel. And I think mm -hmm. it's such a gift, you know, to be able to to explore the world from different positions mm -hmm. is a great gift and I think it adds greatly to the to the well to the empathy basically of the mm -hmm. poet and to your sensibility it adds to your sensibility and this sensibility you need to be able to filter the world through you in the best possible way and and, and make that link between the the from the universal through the idiosomatic filter of your own cognitive system mm -hmm. and back into a poetry that's hopefully on a good day it, relevant to other people too, because it resonates with the with the with the common consciousness that we all share. Again, so this journey to, to do that, you need mm -hmm. to be a sensitive person, you know. And I think travel is very good for that. Have you got a poetic specialty, or have you got any of your dreams? Oh, do you mean if I if I if I am there where I imagined I would be? Mm -hmm. Oh, what? no, no, not at all. I mean. I think no. I mean, I always wanted to. I wanted to be a writer from when I was 15, mm -hmm. but I didn't. No, I had no way. I imagined it would be like this. I had no idea. I imagined so many other things, but not not this. But uh, I think I'm, I'm very happy about my international dimension of my authorship and 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 the friendships and the networks that I've formed with, with poets around the world. It's, it means a lot to me, and I plan to work on that in the coming years to strengthen that further and strengthen that dimension, do more travel, more international uh, work, and more collaborative projects with other poets. How many countries have you visited? As a poet? 
as a poet? As a poet, I think 18. 18, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, the most places have inspired you to write? I think, well, the, the, the funny thing is that each time as a, as a poet and I visit a new country, I sort of feel that I become one of them. So now I'm also a Finnish person, and I'm an Estonian person, and I'm an Armenian person, and I'm, all these places I've been, I, I can kind of like put that flag in my head and identify with that. Um, and there's a lot of countries still left, you know, but the thing is, I'm often invited back. Like here in Finland, is it maybe the fourth time? or And, and so, you know, it, it's a challenge to keep adding new countries when you have to come keeping coming back to the old countries, of course, mm -hmm. to strengthen the connections you have there and, mm -hmm. and present new stuff to the audience there and the readership. But and I like to give something back to that place that that's been good to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm planning on publishing a, a collection here in Finland. Uh, hopefully, it'll be next year. Kalle Ninlin Kankas will will translate. Most probably, mm -hmm. and and it will be I hope published here in in, in 2016, 17. I have a collection coming out in Ukraine. It's already translated because mm -hmm. I was also invited there three four times, and I like that also. So Romania is coming out a project now in the spring. Um, two times I've been there, um, and yeah, Australia actually. But I haven't been there yet. But hopefully the collection will allow me to go. Let's know. If, are you trusting with learning different languages? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm. I'm I, I wish that I could speak, you know, all the languages of humanity. How many of them do you know? Perfect. Uh, no. At mother tongue level, only English and Danish. Mm -hmm. I, I. I wish I could write in other languages also because I think it. It allows you to get in contact with a different sphere of yourself mm -hmm. uh, and if you could just speak eight, ten, six languages maybe, I think you could have a much bigger mm -hmm. um, command of your instrument, mm -hmm. uh, of yourself as an instrument in your poetic works, you know, mm -hmm. that if you can just communicate with one language. but. It's not going to be in this life, I don't think so, because time is short and, you know. Have you ever tried to learn Finnish? Uh, no, I have never. I, I, I'm very fascinated by the, by its, you know, its whole, the somberness of it, and it's, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. But I haven't tried to learn to speak Finnish, not that I can ease. <laughs> no, I haven't. What words do you know in Finnish language? Sauna, Ullu, Ullut. Uh, language, I, I, yeah, well, I, I think especially the suffix, actually, the line, like Turku line and Suomi line and mm -hmm. Biblioteka line, and, mm -hmm. you know, interview line. And <laughs> I don't know so many words, but I like it. I think, I think every language, I can't think of any language that's not extremely beautiful when you read poetry in it. Even languages like German that can be like a little bit square and weird. When you read poetry in Germany, it's beautiful. In mm -hmm. Swedish, you read poetry beautiful. In Arabic, in Finnish, in every language, you know. Utmort, it's beautiful. Russian is beautiful. Danish is beautiful. How does the Finnish language in poetry sound to you? I think it's very Finnish. The Finnish voice to me is very... It's a little bit folkloristic. And it's more so folkloristic than it is in Denmark. Mm -hmm. uh, in in Estonia, it's even more folkloristic. But here in Finland, it's like a mixture. You have this, you have this shamanic kind of tone that's like in all the poetry here mm -hmm. that you don't find in, 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 in when you go south in, in, in the Nordic countries or, or, or further down in Europe. It's it's very distinct. Basically, maybe the I don't know if you can say that the poetry will somehow. Be shaped by the by the geography or the the biotope of the country, but this big wilderness here in Finland with the woodlands and stuff, you can feel it in the poetry. It's in the people, it's in their hearts, and it's also in their words. Mm -hmm. This big, strong, crazy nature that they have here, you know, it's in them. It's, it's very nice. What I like about them.
Well, basically, language is, 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 is so many things, right? It's, a, it's an instrument of, of communication, of love and emotion and transcendence and everything. And I think every language like that is beautiful. Every language has its song and its, of its own and its own kind of particular resonance with the, with the human with the human organism, basically. So every language will have its, its magic, a magic of its own. Between English and Danish, where do you find yourself as a writer? I, I think it's it's different it's different sides of me, simply different layers of myself that I'm in contact with when I when I write in the different languages. I think uh, I've been doing a lot of English stuff, but of course I did also a lot of Danish stuff. I I don't know. I think when I as soon as I leave my country, it's English for sure. I mean, I wouldn't sit here and make a Danish poem. Mm -hmm. I, I, I could do it, but I wouldn't do it. I would naturally, it would be in English. What is the definition of poetry, in your opinion? That's a good question. It's a very good question. It's a big question. Uh, well, if you ask me what poetry can do as a genre, as a literary genre, mm -hmm. I think what poetry can do is that poetry can capture the moment. Poetry can capture the now as one of the few and, and kind of dissect the now and fold it out like a flower. That's what poetry can do. Poetry can, yeah, you can, you can hit dive into the now via poetry or with poetry, yeah. Do you translate from English into Danish? Some of the stuff that I write, I, I choose to translate also, and, and some of the pieces will just be untranslated and, and only be in one of the languages. But I translate back and forth between them also, of my own pieces, mm -hmm. and occasionally also work on other people's stuff, but uh, mainly my own, actually. What do you try to address by poetry? I try to address, well... Um, well, basically, Political injustice mm -hmm. or arrogance, uh, the, 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 the faults of our current way of writing the world into existence or dreaming the world into existence. Mm -hmm. um, well, basically, I'm, I think it's, I'm trying to dissect the, the things that I, you know, I'm trying to look behind the, see behind the lines or beneath the facade. I'm trying to basically find out what it's about, what being is about, and I think it entails everything. Through your own lens, how do you interpret the crisis of refugees? They have called it as a crisis. Well, basically, I think that it's... First of all, it's horrible for the people that are fleeing. And second of all, I think that there are refugees all over the world right now, on almost all the continents, uh, and there is a lot of refugees that we never even hear about in the media. There's a lot of refugees that are never mentioned, and if you ask me about the particular stream of refugees that are coming into Europe uh, now, right now, I would say that it's orchestrated and it's orchestrated on a completely different level than I'm, I'm not talking about how people talk to each other and, and in their desperation and want for a better life and say where should we go what should we do well the 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 the, 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 the smith family went that way mm -hmm. maybe we should also go that way you know mm -hmm. it, that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about that it's it's orchestrated on a completely different level there has been people doing calculations about what would happen if you would destabilize that regime in Syria and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and, and Iraq, you know, and they've been calculating, I promise you, you know, to the 200th decimal, you know, what would be the possible consequences of this and this happening and what would happen then. So I think it's, it's orchestrated and it's for a purpose and it's got nothing to do with, regrettably, the individual suffering of all these families and poor, horrible you know, psychological trauma that it is, you know, for, for families to fucking run away from everything and try to, you know, say goodbye basically to where you're from and, and start again from scratch somewhere else where you don't know anything about what's going on there and don't know the people or anything. Is it a new crisis in history of humanity? 
I think it, I think you no know, creating refugees and people fleeing from bad things, yes. trying to get a better life is probably something we always had, mm -hmm. regrettably. Um, but I think this crisis is for a purpose, uh, whether it's for to destabilize Europe or make a or, or change the demographics of the European population so that it becomes younger. I don't know what it's for, but I think there is a purpose, and it's got nothing to do with the well-being of you or I. I mean, it's not the first time that a human no. had to travel, that he had traveled before, that from the beginning of the humanity that we went, when we're, we were in our African homes, that we quit, we abandoned our African homes by mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. because of the nature, but now because of a human, we abandoned our land, mm -hmm. and then we traveled and when we deployed in over the world. So it's not new for our world that you no, have no. to travel because it's life. Mm -hmm. How yes. Do you comment on that? Yes and no, I would say because because I, I think I think it's a very dangerous logic. Mm -hmm. On the on the other hand, because yes, of course, it's true that people have all there's always been refugees from for one reason or another mm -hmm. throughout the, the, the mankind's history or history as we know of. On the other hand, that's a little bit like saying, you know, oh, but we are greedy and we are competitive mm -hmm. and we are selfish, while you forget the other side of the story. I mean, why do you have to have refugees? The answer is, you don't really, we, we don't, we didn't sign a contract that we would make a globe where people had to flee from shit all the time. No. We could maybe make it better and make it unnecessary for people to do that. And speaking of the, the psychological traits that we have, you know, why are we not telling ourselves the full story? Why do we allow for, for traits like greed, aggressiveness, competitiveness to be to to tell ourselves these are dominant traits in humanity? No, they're not. What about self-sacrifice? What about kindness? What about generosity what about love these are the fucking dominant traits in us not the other ones these are the crocodile traits you know the reptile traits and that's the whole thing about that plan you can call me paranoid but the thing is what you see today is like alligator capitalism on the bottom this is what they wanted to believe that this is the only way it can be yeah you have to bite your fellow neighbor you know to, to get ahead and it's competitive and all that while on the top they have gift economy already you know, if you're like a multinational bank and you're like, oh, yeah, well, you know, I kind of lost three fantasillion million trillion dollars, you know, then your friends are going to say, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We'll just put a big fat fucking clink through it. Forget it. What money? And it's gone, you know. That's the top. The bottom, they want to have us like a pool of alligators biting each other's tails and shit. But it's not true. We're not like that. We're We're love organisms, you know, interdimensional light beings. We're not alligators. Or we can choose, at least, if we want to be worms or angels. You know? mm -hmm. I think we should choose the angel instead of the worm. Are you married? No. No, no married. Mm -hmm. Not married. You don't plan to be like a great family. Uh, if I meet, if I meet a nice girl, maybe if it'll happen, it'll happen. That'd be nice. I'm not opposed to it. You know, I'm not opposed to having children as well. I would love to have children. If I could have children myself, I would have had many now. But you need, you know, it never happened. But not for, you know, on purpose. So you are looking for. Yeah, I'm always looking. Poets fall in love all the time. Don't you know that? You know, mm. all the time. In ideas, in people, in places. So it's just I fall in love all the time. It's all the time. They say a poet is like a bird, goes from branch to branch or from flower to flower. It's that's funny because I heard that one of my one of my Indian friends and co he's also a, he's a playwright and a poet and an actor also and he said exactly the same to me. He's like, yeah, yeah, people like us, you know, yeah, we need to. He said exactly the same as you're saying now. So maybe it's true that we need change and, and yeah, that we like birds. Maybe it could be true. I mean, I know I, I did my share of flying from flower to flower, so yeah. For how long do you want to stay uh, hmm? looking for this? For how long I will keep looking? Mm -hmm. Always, I think. Always. Yeah. Do you see yourself that you are obliged to catch a family as soon as possible? No, I, do, I don't, because I, I lost both of my parents, so that pressure is not there anymore. 
-hmm. You know, if there was a pressure, to the extent that there was a pressure, not that it was a big pressure or anything, but mm -hmm. now it's just for me, and I think maybe that's also part of the journey, and maybe, mm, maybe it's just, maybe you have many soulmates, maybe you just don't, don't just have one soulmate, maybe you have many. And maybe, you know, we can also negotiate different structures of family and different structures of relationship and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, uh, I think we, we're also being very hard on ourselves because we are, we are using our own lives mm -hmm. to fulfill some names or some poems that are, 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 are frames that are told us about like romantic love, for instance. Mm -hmm. This is a big thing in the West, right? That, and we're all kind of, kind of programmed with the, with the, with the longing for that. Mm -hmm. And it's an illusion, like so many other things. It's it's all in your mind. It's a construct, you know. From the perfect love, the one and only. It's like, yeah, yeah, you know. It's not like that. What does loneliness mean to you? Well, loneliness is, I think, as a writer, mm. uh, or as an artist working with like individual expressions when you're not like a filmmaker or anything. But it's some. It, it's every poet's friend, you know. You know, it walks next to you, you know, because you need to. In order to do this job, you need to you need to be comfortable in your own company. You need to be okay with just being you, mm -hmm. alone. And you can be alone without being lonely, but sometimes, of course, also, you get lonely when you're alone or when you're with people. Like traveling, for instance, can be a little bit lonely, especially if it's unknown territory. I feel it can be more lonely. Like if I go to a a civilization or a region I haven't been to before, then it's because you're more vulnerable and also I can feel a little bit more lonely. But usually I don't feel lonely when I'm alone, not at all. I'm fine with being alone. Thank you for joining us. Now we want, would like to hear your last words. Famous last words. Well, forward towards the infinite universe. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And I thank you as well for watching. Hope to meet you again. This is Ahmed Zadani greeting you again from city of Turku in Finland. Goodbye.